theme of this series is guided into the future. And you know the fact of the matter is you and I cannot see the future. We don't know what the future holds. And that's a good thing, isn't it? Aren't you glad God didn't tell you what was going to happen? Sometimes we wish God would tell us what's going to happen, but then you look at your life and you're like, even when it's good, you're like, I'm glad God didn't tell me. I'd have been laying awake with eyes wide open uh, thinking about it. But we have a God who knows who we are, he knows where we are, and he knows what we need. And whatever the circumstance, God knows. God knows where you're at. He knows who you are. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows details about you. He cares about details about you you don't even care about. He's so aware of where we are, and he knows exactly what we need. And that's why as we come to Psalm 23, and it is one of the great psalms, I would encourage everybody here, even if you're not big on Scripture memory, even if, if memorizing is difficult for you, memorize Psalm 23. Because it's such an encouragement. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And now verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's very, very encouraging, isn't it? It's very, very comforting to realize all that God's doing and to think about. Sometimes we read Scripture too fast. Sometimes we don't think about it hard enough, deep enough, long enough to let it get in our spirit, to let us change us, to let it encourage us, to let, let us get a hold of things about God, truths about God. This is a psalm that will hold you and I in the midst of a worldwide pandemic or anything else that happens in our life. Now, as we look at this, and the, the title of the message is that God is so good. He just is so good, right? And so what I want us to do is I want us to look at three aspects of his goodness. First of all, God is good in the midst of trouble. God is good in the midst of trouble. In the midst of your battle, God is good. In the midst of that struggle, God is good. In the midst of that problem, God is good. There is not anything you and I can, will encounter in life where God is not good. That doesn't mean what's happening to us is good. What we know is God can take the evil and work it for the good. But even in the midst of going through the hard times, the difficult times, the painful times, the discouraging times. God is good. He's good in the midst of trouble. Settle that in your heart. Make that a conviction of your soul. Because what the enemy wants you to do, he wants you to doubt what God says, and then he wants you to doubt that God's good. He wants you to believe God's not good. He wants you to believe that God's not fair. He wants you to believe God's not there and God doesn't care. And none of that is true. Settle it in your heart. God is good. Because the last thing you and I need in the midst of a trouble is, is to be trying to decide if we believe God is good. God is good. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Well, Psalm 23, verse 5, let's look at it. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. What it's talking about there is God preparing a banquet. In the Oriental mindset, in the, in the Mideast, the, the thing that you would do if you wanted to honor somebody is you would give a banquet. You wouldn't just feed them, which certainly would be a time of fellowship, but you would, you would give them, you'd roll out the red carpet, you would give them a banquet. And you see it throughout Scripture. When you read the Old Testament, watch for it. All the times there are these banquets and what's happening. For example, in Genesis chapter 18, I'll just give you one example. The Lord appeared to him, to Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre, and as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said... O oh Lord, if I found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. So he sees these three men. He immediately knows one of them is the Lord. We don't know how he knows that, but he knows. He says, rest while I bring a morsel of bread. Now, I don't know what you'd picture a morsel to be. But I, I mean, a slice of bread maybe is a morsel. A half a piece of bread maybe a morsel. That you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly to the tent of Sarah and said, quick, three seahs of fine flour, get them, knead it, and make cakes. You know what we're talking about there? We're talking about somewhere between 15 and 22 quarts of flour. I mean, how many loaves of bread does that make? I don't know, but it's a lot. I mean, you think of this, so all of a sudden, what's Abraham doing? The Lord is there, he wants to honor the Lord, and so what is he gonna do? He's making a banquet for the Lord. 22 quarts of flour. And they're making bread, and Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the young man who prepared it quickly. So now he's got, there's three men going to eat, and he's slaughtering a calf. So they're going to have veal. Sounds really good. Then he took curds and milk. What are curds? Like cottage cheese. So he's got cottage cheese, he's got milk, he's got the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. So here they are. He's not eating. He's watching them eat. But he has made this ginormous banquet for them for their enjoyment. Now back to Psalm 25. You prepare, a, or 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And I can promise you this. God has more resource, God is more generous than Abraham, and he's not just preparing for you and I a bologna sandwich, but he's preparing a banquet. Now, in verse 5, it goes on, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. What's happening there? Well, the anointing would be in part a courtesy to people because in that day there's not deodorant and there's not um, depending on the culture the amount of bathing uh, available and uh, so in the and it would be a very arid climate so the the anointing with oil and it wasn't just like we would anoint the sick it would be an actually pouring of oil um, and myrrh on a person's head so that we'd actually get on their skin. Their, their skin would, would glow, uh, would have that moisturizer on it. In fact, there are ancient examples uh, in Assyrian text from Esarhaddon's reign describes how he drenched the foreheads of his guests at a royal banquet with the choicest of oil. So the idea is you're not going to be able to smell the body odor and it's going to moisturize the skin and it would be costly to do it but if you were rich you could do that. 
it would be an act of honor. In fact, it would be an act of dishonor. Remember, Jesus went to the Pharisee's home in Luke chapter 7. The Pharisee did not anoint him at all, didn't offer that to him. And Jesus saw it for what it was. It was a slight. It was a, a way of dishonoring the, the Lord. But here it says, he gives us a banquet. He anoints our head with oil. And then it says, my cup overflows. What are we talking about there? We're talking about wine. So whenever you have wine and it's in a banquet setting, it's celebratory. So this is a, this is a very happy, uh, festive, uh, joyful, abundant, uh, honoring banquet. And, and so here is God, and God is saying, the psalmist is saying, listen, as we walk through life, God is rolling out a banquet continually. As you and I walk through life, God is, he's providing liberally all that we need. He is anointing us. He's setting, uh, the anointing could also be a symbol of the Holy Spirit. He's setting his presence on us. He's giving us joy. Uh, so the idea is this picture of joy and celebration and abundance. And then would you notice it says this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, this is really interesting. Typically, we would think, well, if we got enemies, this is a time to do battle. That if we got enemies, this is a time to, to hide or a time to be afraid or a time to, to, you know, be fighting or be focused on the enemy. But when you're walking with the Lord, the idea is that, that as we go through life, there will be enemies, but none of the difficulties we encounter in life keep us from experiencing the abundance and the celebration and the joy and the provision and the anointing of the Lord. In life, all of those things belong to us that we don't have to be, we don't have to focus. You know, the, the, here's the problem. And, and really, this is the theological underpinning for joy in the midst of trials. Though outwardly we're wasting away, Paul says, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. It's because he's prepared a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Paul could say that in a Roman prison. Paul can say that because God is providing for him. God is with him. God is anointing him. God is giving him joy. Remember in Philippians, we saw that in our series Joyride. Paul writes over and over again, I rejoice. How? Because Psalm 23. See, God wants you and I to be able to celebrate his goodness even in the difficulties of life. God is good in the midst of trouble. Second, God is good in the midst of failure. Look at this, Psalm 23 and verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That word goodness conveys the idea of the goodness of God. He's a God who is good, and because he's a God who is good, he is a God who does good things. The idea of goodness has to do not with just the quality of, of something, but with the God who is doing it. God is providing goodness. It, it's really a, an expression similar to Psalm 119 and verse 68. I quote it all the time. You are good and do good. God is a good God. Settle it in your heart. He's good. He does good. The reason why Jesus is called the good shepherd is because he's a good God who does good for people. Whatever we're, we go through in life, God's good. He is good all the time, not just when everything is going your way, not just when it's easy, not just when uh, you can't see any problems on the horizon. God is good all the time. He is good. It says, surely, goodness and mercy. That word is the, the word, it's the most commonly used descriptor of, of God's attribute. It's not, a lot of people say, what's the number one attribute of God mentioned in the Bible? It's not holy and it's not love. It's hesed, C-H-E-S-E-D in the, in the Hebrew. 
It is, it is loving kindness. It is, it's translated as his abundant kindness, his loving kindness, his unfailing kindness, his devotion. God is incurably kind. When God's going to reveal himself to Moses, and Moses is, is in the cleft of the rock, and the Lord passes by, and, and the voice cries out, the Lord, what? Merciful, hesed, the, full of loving kindness. He's a God who is good. When you fail, he is kind. When you falter, he is kind. You know, a lot of people have a, a wacky theology that when they fail, God turns away and wants nothing to do with them. That's not in the Bible. When you fail, he is kind. When you falter, he is kind. When you don't even care about him, he's kind. He's kind before you got saved because the Bible says in Romans 2, it's the kindness of God that leads us to salvation, and he's kind to you after you get saved. Why? Because he's kind. He is a good God. He won't abandon you. He is devoted to you. Now watch this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It's very interesting. It's not like they're going before me. It's like they're following me. And if you think in terms of a shepherd and you would picture sheepdogs who are trying to keep the flock moving in the right direction, you've got goodness and you've got mercy and they're hounding you because God is leading you. How does God guide you? He guides you with his mercy. He guides you with his goodness. He's a good God. You say, well, doesn't God ever discipline people? Sure he does, but even in his discipline, he's kind. Even in his discipline, he's good. I mean, if you have a godly parent, if you were raised in a godly home, if you are a godly parent, in your discipline, are you kind? In your discipline, are you good? Hopefully you are. I mean, God is all the time. So she'll follow me all the days of my life. They're, they're chasing after you. They're following you. They're right there with you. That leads us to the third thing. God is good all the time. He is good all the time. You say, well, why don't I feel that way? And the question is, where are you putting yourself relative to the goodness and kindness and presence of the Lord? Look at this in verse 6. It says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell, or I shall dwell, in the house of the Lord forever. I want you to notice something Verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6. The shepherd does everything. Remember the first week we had a, had a sheep up here, and the sheep didn't do anything except, you know, make noise and eat. But the sheep couldn't teach you. That you couldn't teach you anything, couldn't really tell you anything couldn't provide you anything. Not on its own, it couldn't. I'm just, I'm just saying the shepherd is the one who does everything. What do you and I have to do? We just have to dwell. We just have to, we just have to be in his presence. We just have to be near him. That's why you made, you made a, an awesome choice to be at the West Campus tonight, to be watching online wherever you're at, to be at the North Campus, to be at Joplin, to be here, you made an awesome choice because you said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be in his presence. The word dwell in, in the Hebrew means to turn or to return. And I will turn to the house of the Lord forever. I will return to the house of the Lord forever. You see, every time you come into the house of God, you're positioning yourself. This is why, I'm just telling you, this is why church 
and, and the discipline, and it is a discipline because hell hates it when you give time for church. If you're watching online, hell hates it when you say, listen, it's church time. This is not time to go walk the dog and watch, watch the service. And if you're doing that, I would advise against it. So if you're watching and I offended you, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm just telling you the truth that you needed to hear as you're watching this. So sit down on the park bench and dial in and watch the rest of the service, okay? <laughs> you know, I'm just saying this is the time to focus. I mean, you're making the right call by coming to church if you can. I understand people can't come. But I, I, I'm just, there is such value to being in the presence of the Lord. It, it opens our lives up to the goodness of the Lord. That's why I, I tell parents all the time, listen, get your kids in church. Because when they're in the presence of the Lord, good things happen. Why? Because he's a good God. You want, you want your kids to be directed. You want the, the sheepdogs of mercy and goodness following your kids, nipping on their heel to get them in the right place, get them in the presence of the Lord, right? That, that's why we would do things like camp. That's why we do things like retreats. That's why we, we want to have them in church, and you want to be in church because you and I need the Lord to direct our steps, right? We need the Lord to go before us. We need the Lord to help us. We want to experience the goodness of the Lord. I just don't want Debbie and, and my family. I, I want to have the goodness of the Lord, right? And the good news is God wants us to have it in all we have to do is dwell in his presence. Just keep showing up in his presence. And when you and I do that, man, we're going to experience what only God can do. And we're going to watch, we're going to watch the shepherd take care of the situations that we have, and we will not lack anything. And we're going to watch the shepherd make us at times lie down. He's going to say, stop. Don't go anywhere. Stop. I want you to digest what I'm doing in your life. Stop your activity and just rest. That's a good thing. That's Sabbath. He, he's going to, as he's leading you, he's going he's gonna to take you beside the still water. He's going to quench your thirst. He's going to give you living water. He's going to restore your soul. He's going to guide you in paths of righteousness, the right paths for your life. He's got a path for you. And all you, when people say, oh, I just want to know the will of God, just be in God's presence. If you're in God's presence, you'll find yourself living out his will. You know, too many people make, you know, too many people are too caught up in a decision they're going to make. Listen, just be in his presence. Be in his presence and watch what God will do just by being in his presence. And when there's, when there's evil times and demonic times and difficult times, when there's times that, that you feel like, you, you know, it's, there's death, He's with you. You don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of the times or the seasons that we're living in. He's with us. And he's got a rod that will, he'll club anybody who tries to attack you. And he's got a staff that he can, he can direct you and guide you. And then he's going to feed you. He's going to prepare a banquet for you in the presence of your enemies. He's going to anoint your head. He's going to care about, about, you know, having his fragrance on your life. You're going to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and you're going to have joy in your heart, and he's going to have goodness and mercy following you all the days of your life. And all you and I have to do is just show up. We just have to be in the presence of the Lord. What makes heaven heaven is the presence of the Lord. What, what strengthens us, what changes us, what makes the, pr the prayer meeting, the prayer meeting is you and I being in the presence of the Lord. Just saying, you know what, I, I just want to be in his presence. I just, I just want to be where he is.
So right now, would you just lift your hands, or would you stand? Let's stand right now in his presence. Would you lift your hands? You know, and just take a deep breath and enjoy his presence. Lord, we love you. Your presence is amazing. God, may your presence touch every heart, every mind, every life. May we set aside the problems of life and enjoy the presence of God. And just know that in your presence is fullness of joy. I pray, Lord, that, that we would right now as your people at every campus, those watching online, let your presence fill each place, each campus, and especially each heart. Lord, we've just come to be with you, just to be with you. Because just in being with you, everything we need is taken care of. Lord, we love you. Come on, would you just tell him you love him? Come on, t tell him with your voice. Lord, I love you. Lord, you're so awesome. You're so awesome. We praise your name. 